Acts chapter 4. The text for this morning's message will be taken from verses 32 through chapter 5 and verse 11. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself, with his wife's full knowledge, and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard it. The young men got up and covered him up. And after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours. And his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her. Tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out as well. And immediately, she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. We've been studying the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was in the beginning with God because he shares the same exact essence, being God the Son, to God the Father. And without Jesus Christ, nothing was made that was made. You know, Jesus is not just the Omega, but he is said to be also the Alpha. And when God said, let us make man, Jesus himself gave his deity blessing upon that counsel and work. And knowing all things, the covenant of redemption was set forth in the mind of God from before the foundations of the world. And God knew that in the disobedience of one, many would be made sinful. For as by the one man sinned, and so death passed upon all men. Adam did not keep God's command, and his heart fell to a depraved nature, whereby he and his seed would now be at a hostile enmity towards God. And the wages of sin is death. Death is a horrible monster that breeds a pain of many tears. And sin brought death to the good condition that God had made man in. 
Sin brought spiritual death, and sin brought a physical death that is both progressive, as the outward man perishes day by day, and finally, in that it has been appointed unto all men once to die, as the body returns to dust, and the spirit returns to God as the giver of all life. But the scriptures speak of an eternal death that is to be avoided at all cost. Because after physical death will be a judgment by which all must stand before Jesus Christ to give an account of what we have done in our bodies, whether good or bad. All authority has been given to the Son. And one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is not only a sweet and gracious lamb, but also a powerful judge of great wrath. Hell, friends, is real, and eternal torment is the final sentence of death for all those that do not believe in Christ. And Jesus spoke much about the horror of eternal conscious punishment, not to scare sinners, but to show the love that prompted him to provide a way of escape for sinners that come to him through faith. Jesus did not speak much about how to torture sinners before their time as one that takes pleasure in the death of the wicked. God was grieved that he had made man when he saw evil ruin mankind. And Jesus agreed to humble himself and take on the form of a man, of sinful man, Jesus came down from heaven to dwell among men as a babe in whom all the fullness of deity dwelt in that bodily form. And he was pursuing his plan of redemption and his incarnation was the seed of the woman that was promised to come and crush the head of the serpent. And Jesus knew that he must be about his father's business. And he knew also that it was the will of his father to crush him on the cross. And for the joy of saving his people, he endured his crucifixion. And as he died, he set the chief cornerstone to his building. And he chose the apostles to be its foundation. And he promised to build his church with these precious stones so that the gates of hell can never ever prevail against her. In our text we have the church after Jesus rose from the grave and after Jesus ascended into glory where he sits right now at the right hand of the Father. The Acts of the Apostles is the extension ministry of what Jesus began to do and teach while he was here. Jesus is still alive and well and building his church. And there has been great opposition to the advancement of his kingdom. But the church has a divine spirit of unity that has enabled her to withstand all threats of opposition. And there's something very special and sweet about the unity of the church of Jesus Christ. And the high priest of the church ever lives to make intercession for this unity of his church. And I'd like for us to notice in verse 32 how local church unity is defined. Verse 32 describes the church in Jerusalem as a congregation. There was a multitude number of Christians at this time in Jerusalem. Now the number of Christians doesn't itself guarantee unity. Unity. 
It actually is more evidence to the divine nature of the church and her unity. You see, it's easy for one to have unity with himself. But it gets extremely more difficult the more souls you add to the mix of trying to be in unity together. And at this time, the church had two growth spurts of several thousand people. And the Lord also had been adding daily as such were being saved. And there is strength in numbers. But a house divided against itself cannot stand. These thousands of Christians made up a multicultural church. As many came from all nations, according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 5. They spoke different languages. They came from different areas. Not a few hundred, but several thousand souls. There are many churches with less than a hundred that can hardly agree on anything. And yet this church of several thousand, according to verse 32, was of one heart and one soul. The divinity of this unity is expressed in verse 32 as this congregation was made up of those who believe. They were all people of one faith, one Lord, one church, one baptism. They all were drawn to Jesus by the Father with an effectual calling of abundant grace. They were not merely united in location, but were united back to their Creator with regeneration. Instead of enmity, through Jesus they now have peace with God, and through his blood the forgiveness of sins. Their union to God brought them into union with one another as one family of God. And by this we know that they have passed from spiritual death into spiritual life because they evidence a united love for the brethren. This was not just a multitude of people, but a very large congregation of those who believed. Those who believed in Jesus as their Lord and only Savior from sin. Those who believed and obeyed the gospel call to repentance. Those whom the Lord opened their hearts to savingly respond to the gospel. Now the application for you and I is that local church unity proceeds from a union with Christ by grace through faith by becoming born again and believing in Christ. What fellowship does light have with darkness? What unity does Christ have with Belial? What unity can people who believe in Christ have with those that do not believe in Christ? Union with God brings sweet communion with his people. Sharing the Savior is what enables Christians to share their possessions with one another. Loving the head of the church demands a love for the body of Christ. This is why we must have the gospel right and build the church not with the wood, hay, and stubble of other gospels, but with those precious stones that believe in Christ. Only the gospel can make such precious stones who believe, especially amongst a multitude of mixed people. 
different languages, different cultures. You see, when the wall of partition comes down between God and men, so too does the wall of disunity come down between men and men. Jew and Gentile reconciled to one another because they've been reconciled to God through Christ. Salvation, biblically speaking, is the key to end racism. Jesus Christ is the only way to solve the Middle East conflict between Palestinians and Jews. The propagation of the gospel is the best way to combat the spread of Islamic terrorism. Local church unity is a condition which sinners come into when they are saved, indwelt, and sealed by the Holy Spirit. And notice how this local church unity is displayed. In verse 32, we're told that this one heart and soul unity of this congregation enabled them to do certain things. Not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And in verse 34, there were some that were owners of land and houses that would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales to be distributed to those who had need. Now let us be careful in rightly dividing the word of truth with regards to many things that the early church did as a unique and special time of Holy Ghost operations. Not all that happened in the early church was meant to be normal or normative for the church today. The modern church does not need to mimic everything that happened in the early church. There are some operations of the Holy Spirit that have ceased. When was the last time you saw or heard of in all of church history where someone was a little off in their giving and the church leadership approached them and they were struck dead? You see, the context demands that the Spirit of God is working in ways that are not ordinary, and thus we are not to expect these things to be ordinary for the church today. And one of the dangers of fundamentalism is a reading of a text always with literalism without taking into consideration the context of what we call tota scriptura, all of the Bible. Not one verse of the Bible was written to be a matter of one's own private interpretation, but all of scripture was breathed by God and is therefore profitable for doctrinal precision and accurateness. So when we read in verse 32 through verse 35, how some early church Christians sold their possessions and brought it to the church for distribution to the needy. We must not think it to be wrong for a believer today to own their own possessions. It is a wonderful working of the Spirit of God to move a believer to give from their own possessions. But this is not to be normative or to be taken as an imperative example for us today. Communal living and communal giving is not what the scriptures teach as a necessity for those who believe. But we don't want to overlook the doctrine that is being taught here in our text. The doctrine expressly put by James in chapter 2 is that faith without evidence, without works, 
is dead and it cannot save. And James tells us in verse 15 of chapter 2 that if a brother or sister is in need, that's the case here. And one of you in the church says to them, go in peace, be warm and be filled, and yet you do not give what is necessary for their body, physical means to help. What use is that? What profit is that? We are not obligated to give everything we have as Christians. But we are obligated to give if we are truly saved and able to do so. If you see somebody in need, it's common sense and an ethical, moral procedure to help if you can. We don't give to be saved, we give because we have been saved. We should have a sincere and a genuine care about not only the spiritual welfare of one another as Christians, but also the physical welfare of one another. Now the soul is much more important than the body, but bodily needs are also important. And the church must resist neglecting its spiritual ministerial focus when they seek to address physical needs. But a truly spiritual ministry should have a focus on physical needs as well as spiritual needs. Jesus says the poor we will always have with us. The gospel is not a wealth gospel. The poor you will always have with you. But the scriptures teach many principles towards how the church should seek to help folks when they come into this time of need. One of them is in 1 Timothy chapter 5. In verse 9, where it talks about caring for widows in the church, let them be put on the list to be taken care of if, and only if, she washes the saints' feet, she's 60 years old, she's been the wife of one man. In other words, there's conditions. The apostle and God, through his word, gives us conditions. In other words, we are not to give out money indiscriminately to anybody who comes and says they have a need. It's if, just like the apostles, when they tell us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10, when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. This is what the New Covenant, the New Testament, this is what the Bible teaches. This is the God of love that is seeking to meet the needs of people, that commands us. That if we see somebody in need, we are to reach out. But there's certain principles that we need to apply if we're going to do it with wisdom from God. The scriptures also tell us that our needs should come from our family first, if at all possible. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, that means his own family. And especially for those of his household, he's denied the faith and he's worse than an unbeliever. So there's an obligation for us to provide for ourselves, if at all possible, and that we should work to do so. But the next step to look to to meet our needs is from family members. Family should take care of family. That's the first means that we should go to for help especially if they profess to believe, lest they become worse than an unbeliever. But another principle of help in Scripture for physical needs is the government. Now Romans in 13 tells us that God ordains the powers that be. And in verse 6 of Romans chapter 13, listen to what the Apostle Paul says. For because of this you also pay taxes. Taxes. 
You know why you pay taxes? For rulers and the government are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. And Paul had been talking about that they're there to punish the wicked and to reward the good. And sometimes the good fall on hard times and are in need of food or shelter. Now, if the government should never ever be used in any type of welfare purposes, well, then we have God himself sinning when he saved his own people with the government welfare program of Joseph in Egypt. You see, the church unity compelled them to care for the needs of others. But in the context of other biblical principles, the church is not the first nor the primary means of which people's needs should be met. It's one avenue to meet those needs when others are exhausted. Notice in verse 33 how the church leaders refuse to become sidetracked from the priority of the gospel. Verse 33 tells us that with great power they were giving testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. What a display of church unity. Sacrificial giving brought about by hearts of true love for the brethren in need of the local church. What a display in unity both in love and in solid purpose keeping the main thing the main thing while ministering in other ways. The church knew the importance of meeting physical needs, but the church also knew the priority of giving testimony to the gospel as God's witnesses. They maintained their evangelistic fervor in their outlook even when they also looked inward to meet the needs of the people in the church. And in chapter 5, verse 14, it tells us how the church continued to grow with multitudes of men and women being constantly added to their number of believers. The church was united in her mission and her purpose as they carried out their philosophy of ministry to the lost as well as to the saints. Now, the application for you and I is that we need to maintain a balance in the Christian life and ministry. We work, we play, and we rest, and we balance the three, as well as a ministry to the saved and to the lost around us. We are taught in Scripture to do good to all men, yes, especially to those who are the household of faith. But we are not to neglect opportunities to do good to all men. We live as witnesses to the resurrection of Christ and should pray for opportunities to give testimony to the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Notice also how the church was united in their respect for church leadership. Peter and John were arrested and threatened, and the whole church prayed for them to have boldness in their ministry. And verse 35 tells us that when some sold their land and houses, the money was laid at the apostles' feet. It's a sign of respect. You know, you want to, the old saying is, if you want to see where someone's heart is, look at what they do with their money. And they had respect for the leadership by laying down their funds. There was a respect for their character because it's so very important for leadership in the church to be men of integrity. There is a trust with money, there's a trust with their souls, and the gospel proclamation. And it's interesting to note that the church must have trusted the leadership in their discipline of Ananias and Sapphira. Observe in verse 13 how 
even after the leadership sharply rebuked Ananias and his wife. They were still highly esteemed in love for their work's sake by the congregation. And this is exactly what the apostle says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. But we, we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, that you should esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And then the apostle says this, live in peace with one another because this is the way God has structured it to be so in the church that there would be leaders men that are able to handle difficulties with grace and truth in love what a wonderful testimony it is to the resurrection of Jesus Christ that a local church can remain faithful to the gospel even during times of great persecution. What a powerful testimony it is to the resurrection of Christ when a church takes care of the physical needs of its people. What a tremendous testimony it is to the resurrection of Christ when a church esteems the leaders that Jesus ordained very highly in loving unity for their work's sake. And this is exactly what the writer of Hebrews in chapter 13 and verse 17 had in mind when he said this, obey and submit to those who keep watch over your souls so that they don't have to watch over your souls with grief. For this would be unprofitable for you. When you go against the leadership of the church, you are spreading disunity and dissension. And to maintain unity is to be a good, respectful church member for the opinions of the leadership. Obey and submit, lest it not go well with your own soul. Preserve peace with all men. Jesus brings unity, and the devil breeds disunity. Salvation gives reconciliation when sin causes dissension. The Spirit of Christ builds up and the flesh tears down. Local church unity is a great blessing that requires what verse 33 calls abundant grace to be upon each member. When we yield to the Spirit of God, rather than resist and quench him. When abundant grace is upon the church, there is a great unity to enjoy. But before we elevate the early church as an ecclesiastical utopia, the Lord wants us to understand how even when abundant grace comes upon the whole church, that does not mean that difficulties will never ever arise to threaten the unified peace of the church. And notice with me how the local church unity in our text becomes challenged, threatened to be disrupted. After Barnabas sold a tract of land and brought the money in, in chapter 4, and laid at the apostles' feet, in chapter 5, another named Ananias sought to mimic and do the same thing. The only major difference is that Ananias held back some of the price for himself, but he gave an appearance as if he gave everything like Barnabas did. Not that it was wrong for him to have any of his money, but his sin was that of deception because he made it out to be as if he was giving all the proceeds to the needy while he was really keeping back some of the proceeds for himself. So now we have a member and his wife lying and deceiving the rest 
of the church. Now we have sin in the camp of great abundant grace unity. Now we have a crisis that must be dealt with and it involves confrontation. The church boat of unity is now in the midst of a great storm where the peace of its infrastructure will become severely challenged. So the application for you and I is that each church that enjoys unity ought to expect major challenges and difficulties to come and rock the boat from time to time. Total peace in a local church is like the weather here in Florida. <laughs> if you like it, just wait five minutes. It might change quickly and abruptly. In each believing heart is a strong monster of remaining sin. Another application for us is that new covenant grace does not allow for believers to lie, even if it's a small one. Now, it is good to see the role of accountability that the church has been called to play. When Ananias was questioned, no one withstood Peter to the face with accusations of being a legalist, meddling into places where he does not belong as a church leader. No one rebuked Peter or challenged him for judging the heart and motivations of Ananias when only the Lord knows the heart. In other words, we are our brother's keeper. And when we see another believer that is overtaken in a fault, we, who are spiritual, should seek to go and restore him. Holiness is not only a calling for leaders, but for every church member, like Ananias, and his wife, Sapphira. Another profound observation is that God is immutable, and he does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and will be the same forever. In other words, God was a God of love in the Old Covenant, and he's a God of love in the New Covenant. And God was a God of wrath in the Old Covenant, and he's a God of wrath in the New Covenant. God disciplined and chastened his people in the Old Covenant, and he disciplines and chastens his people in the New Covenant. In verse 5 as well as verse 10, we're told that both Ananias and his wife Sapphira were dead and buried because of their sin of not speaking truth. Again, this is not the normative way of church discipline, but it does teach us that God should not be played with. God is not mocked. This should teach us that sin in the sight of God is not something that God deals with lightly. It also teaches us that God is omniscient. God knows all things. And thus none of his children can lie to the spirit and get away with it. You may lie to your spouse and get away with it. You may lie to your parents and get away with it. You may lie to your boss or the government and get away with it. But no one can lie and get away with it from the sight of God. Now, God may not strike you dead, but he does chastise and discipline those whom he loves. In other words, friends, it may be a small lie but you cannot take fire of lying into your bosom without being burned. It is also good to have a proper view of God and his spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is a person, and his role and work is to convict the world of sin and righteousness. And the Holy Spirit here in our text in verse 3 of chapter 5 was lied to. The Holy Spirit told Ananias that it was wrong. But Ananias told the Holy Spirit that it's right. Ananias quenched and grieved the Holy Spirit. And this is something that you and I do all too often. The Spirit leads our conscience to knowing what to do that is right. But we lie to him when we go against our conscience and knowingly do what is wrong. Now this shows us the constant need for a daily putting to death the deeds of the flesh, mortification of sin. This shows us how corrupt even a believing heart can still be even after being saved. And this shows us how sanctification is an ongoing work of the Spirit that involves this synergism of putting to death the deeds of the flesh on a daily basis. Now in verse 3 we see how Peter told Ananias that Satan has filled his heart. Friends, the devil is real and has been a tempter from the beginning. He's the father of all lies and will tempt you and I to do the same. And we are told to acknowledge the real threat and attacks of our enemy and adversary, the devil. And God gave us armor to put on and commanded us to be on the alert to his schemes. The rebuke of Ananias was not that Satan lied. Why have you lied and allowed Satan to fill your heart? The biblical view of sin and church discipline is that believers are responsible for their actions and behavior. You can't say the devil made me do it. Sin shall no longer have domination power over you who are in Christ. Blame shifting is an unacceptable response for a Christian when dealing with his own sin. Well, it was my background, it was my upbringing, my horoscope says. Satan can fill the heart of a believer with temptations of small sins. He told Ananias to only keep back a portion of the money. He told Ananias to maintain a good Christian appearance of being a very good moral Christian that gives to help needy people while holding on to small secret sins. Satan told Ananias, no one will ever know. It's secret. No one will ever find out. You can get away with it with no consequences. And we should notice the destructive nature of even a small sin. Friend, Satan comes as an angel of light and uses a masquerade of biblical Christianity while he does his work. Ananias opened his heart to deceit and was soon breathing his last and being buried with God's discipline. His sin affected his wife and his local church. Instead of being a good example, he allowed himself to become a bad example. Sin was now in the camp and the church needed to deal with it, to restore Ananias from a way of waywardness. The application for you and I is that church discipline is a tool to help maintain unity. Observe in verse 11, and great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard these things. 
Now, you may be with those who say that it's not good to fear God. But the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the very beginning of wisdom. You want to live a trifle life and just view God as your Abba Father and your buddy in the sky, as if he's not concerned with sin in your life as a new covenant believer, you'll face severe consequences. It ought not to be named amongst Christians. We ought to seek to pursue holiness, without which no man will ever see the Lord. The sum of all the law is to fear God and keep his commandments. There is a healthy way to fearing God. It is good to have regular doses of fear of the Lord, and it will help us to walk along this straight and narrow path of the gospel when we fear God by respecting what he has placed for us, particularly in the local church. There's a means of obedience and submission. Otherwise, it's going to disrupt unity. And it will not be profitable for us to go against the tide of God's abundant grace upon his church. Please stand and let's pray.